How many of you are fans of HGTV? Okay, amen. Yes, hallelujah. Wow, enthusiasm. I like it. 615 service. In case you don't know, you should ask, you should ask him about this, but Dan Garrish was featured on HGTV at one point. And so, anyway, that, he would love to tell you that over Beals tonight. Um, but, uh, but Kristen and I love us some HGTV. Right, we love you know all the all the shows, Good Bones. I used to love Fixer Upper. I may have shed a tear when that went off HGTV. Chip Gaines was like my dude. He was my dude. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the ones we're into right now is Hometown. Hometown. It takes place in Laurel, Mississippi, and and this couple, um, Ben and Aaron, they they the. Ben actually was a youth pastor for a long time. I don't know if you knew that. Fun fact. Um, and, but uh, they, they, they get these houses in their town. And they have a vision to restore the life of their town, right? And so they go around with families or, or individuals, and they show them a couple of houses, right? And then they, they revitalize it. They restore it, right? And, and, and then the end is the big reveal, and, you know, it's all beautiful and done up and designed and probably stays that way for about five minutes, especially ones that have kids living in them. But anyway, anyway, the part of the show that I love, the part of the show that I love is the beginning, where they introduce this family or they introduce this individual or this couple or what have you, and, and they're walking them around these different houses. Now, I know, don't burst my bubble. Somebody tried to come up to me in between the first and second service this morning, like, you know that stage. They already know which house they're buying. Okay, that's fine, right? That's great. Spoiler, you probably Google Survivor winners before the Survivor finale. Like, that's great, right? But like, okay, I do that too. But anyway, like, like I don't like surprises. Um, but, but I love when they walk around and they show these folks, a couple of houses, and what they do is they tell the story of the house. And, and, so, and so they call the houses by the last name of the family that built the house. Like this would be the Vrooman house, right? And the Vrooman house was built in 1971. Let's go there, right? 1971, and the Vroomans lived in it for 40 years before they sold it to go and be close to the grandkids, right? And... Um, and now it's, it's set vacant for about five years, and it's all grown up and all, all these different things, right? And, and what they're doing in this is they're telling the legacy of the house, right? They're telling the story of the house. Now, some people, some people don't like houses, right? We talked about that last week, right? YouTube things, I'm just going to call a guy, right, when the dishwasher breaks. For some people, they like to restore old cars, and they, and they will get an old car, and they, like, they see this vision for this car and what it could be. And what, what s- some of us just see as a pile of metal, others see as a beautiful machine, right? Bruce Elder loves to restore cars. Other people see value in furniture, right? Restoring old furniture, bringing back to life what was. And some people other things. But back to hometown... They, they, they show them this house, and then they give them a painting of what it could be, right? This painting of this beautiful thing. And then they go through the process of, like, gutting things. And here's the point I want to make tonight and that we've been making today is that we're all a restoration story. Like, some of us need a coat of paint. Some of us need a patch job. Some of us need a complete kitchen gut. Right? Like, but the reality is, each and every one of us in the room need an area of our life restored. Each and every one of us. You didn't walk into this room perfect. You're not going to walk out of this room perfect. There's a piece of each and every one of our lives that needs to be restored. And the good news tonight is that God is in the restoration business. And that's the beauty of the message of Jesus. We talked last week about how Jesus redeems us. He saves us from some things, and he saves us to some things. And tonight, we're talking about how Jesus restores us. He restores us. One of the things that blew my mind last year, in the midst of COVID, about this time, is I went to buy a gallon of paint at Ace Hardware in Gorham. 
to paint Vera's room. They had sold out of paint. A hardware store selling out of paint. Because it's amazing, right? It's amazing how when you spend some time in your house, like we all were this time last year, the blemishes that we see, the things that we uncover, the things that we want to get to, right? And so many of us, and, and I feel like this is, you want to talk about, you want to talk about a, 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 a pandemic, an epidemic, right, in our culture, right, is that we try so hard to just keep ourselves busy, to numb ourselves with busyness and all these other things so that we don't see the blemishes that need restoring in our own lives. The first two services didn't get that. What are we just trying to cover up? What are we just trying to put a piece of pipe and drape in front of? Or a rug over? Right? That needs restoring in our lives. And there's no better story to look at in Scripture than the life of Peter when it comes to restoration. Especially this season, especially coming out of Easter and looking at the resurrection and looking at the restoration of Peter. So here's what we're going to do. Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline for the night because we're going to do some Bible surfing. We're going to really just three places, okay? But we're going to start in John 21, which is Peter's restoration. But then I want to go back to Matthew 4 because I want to look at Peter's beginning. Okay, so we're going to talk about Peter's beginning, his rise, then we're going to talk about his wreck, his fall, and then we're going to talk about his restoration back in, 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 uh, in John 21, and then we're going to wrap the thing up with Colossians chapter 1. Sound good? You got that? Somebody want to preach the sermon? Anybody? Any takers? Okay, very, very good, very good. Paul David Tripp says this, the coming of the Prince of Peace is a promise that everything that is damaged by sin will be restored. Say everything. 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 What's everything mean? Everything. All the things, right? And Paul David Tripp says here that what Jesus brings is the promise that everything in our lives that's damaged by sin will be restored. Jerry Bridges, who's a navigator, says this, even when God deems it necessary to discipline us for persistent disobedience, he always does so out of love to restore us to the way of obedience. He always does so out of love to restore us to the way of obedience, right? Some things, some things need to be broken more before they can be restored. Some things need to be sanded down more before they can be brought back to life. Amen? Y'all see where we're going with this, right? John 21, 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Now, for those of us who don't know, let's give you a quick 40,000 foot crash course on this, right? Jesus has been crucified. He was buried three days later. He rose again, the resurrection, right? Jesus is alive. He's risen. He's risen indeed, right? And we talked about that last week, the the redemption, right? For all people, the payment for all sin, for all people, because of the love of God to send his son to be that, right? And, and, And so he is resurrected, and now he's starting to go around and visit with his disciples who have gone back to their daily work. That's going to be really key for us in a little bit. 
What did Peter do? He went back to what he knew what to, how to do. Right? He went back to casting nets for fish. He went back to what he knew before Jesus. He went back to what he was doing three years prior before Jesus called him. He was back to fishing. And Jesus comes and greets them one day while they're fishing. A miracle happened right before this. He cast their nets. 153 large fish were brought in. And then Jesus says, come have breakfast. Come have breakfast. Right? I could hang with Jesus. If he says, come have breakfast, right? Come have breakfast, right? And so let's go back. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4. You can jump there. We'll also have it on the screen. But Matthew chapter 4, let's look at the call of Jesus. Verses, I mean, call of Peter, 18 through 20. While walking by the Sea of Galilee. So now, now this is, boom, flashback three years. Okay? Walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. They thought about it for a little bit. They weighed the pros and cons. Then they left their nets after doing a cost analysis and followed him. Doesn't say that, does it? It says immediately, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. You know what grieves me when, it, when, I, when I think about the call of God these days? I've, I've, been, talk, I've been talking to two pastors this weekend. Well, I've been talking to one pastor and hearing about another event going on in another church. And, and, and talking to somebody. A church split this morning. Isn't that sad? There's a church that split this morning. And then there's, a, there's, a, there's another church where I'm really close with the pastor. And he had an elder resign this morning. You know, to resign this morning. You know why? Tired. Tired. You know why that church is split? Because they don't know how to talk to each other. What grieves me in this, what grieves me in this, is, is looking at Matthew 4, is that we are getting so caught up and divided and exhausted flat out exhausted in the body of Christ over things that don't matter. Jesus looked at Peter and said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. I am calling you to something. I'm calling you to something greater than fishing for fish. I'm calling you to something that's going to that's gonna just rock your life. It's going to change your life. It's going to wreck your life. Right? I mean, you're going to be, you're going to be in and out of prison in the book of Acts. I'm glad Jesus didn't tell him that in the beginning because he might not have immediately followed him. Right? Like, like, like you look at this and what he was signing up for, but it was the call of God on his life. And, and what convicts me and grieves me over the church of Jesus is we're living over preferences and wants and desires instead of the call of God in our lives. Come on now. Tell me it's not true. The two morning services really didn't get that. But I, I, I see this immediately. Immediately. And it rocks me. It rocks me. It rocks me. When my youth pastor, the first mentor meeting I had with my youth pastor after being called to ministry. He gave me a toilet brush. I cleaned the toilets. Most of you have heard that story. And when I came back in the room, he looked at me and he said, be a god person in your calling to ministry. Gada, G-A-D-A. It's a made-up word. And I thought he was cuckoo when he said it too. But you know what it stands for? Go anywhere, do anything. Go anywhere, do anything. Ask questions later. That drives a lot of people around me nuts because that's the way I operate in ministry because I'd rather follow God than logic. I'd rather, I'd rather follow and be obedient to the Holy Spirit than make you happy. Man, it's taken me 10 years to say that. But it felt good. Immediately, 
they left their nets and they followed him. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. This was the rise of Peter. From that moment forward, he began a journey that changed his life forever. It changed his life forever. Peter's zeal for Jesus and his passion for following him was evident throughout Jesus' earthly ministry. His zeal and his passion preceded him everywhere he go, everywhere he went. He was the spokesperson for the disciples. A lot of times that got him a bad rap. It got him in trouble, right? He would ask questions. He would say things first. He was always kind of right out the gate. I can see Thomas so many times rolling his eyes and being like, really, Peter? Really? We're doing this again, Peter? Like Peter was the one that walked on water. Right? Can't you just hear Thomas in the boat like, this is dumb. This is dumb. This isn't going to work, Peter. You should really think about the. Oh, yep, no, he's going. Look at this. John, can you believe? Go, John, go get him. Right? Like, can't you just hear that? But Peter was not afraid to put himself out there. Peter was not afraid to fall flat on his face. And this was the rise of Peter. And then Peter, as we look at the wreck of Peter, it ultimately wrecked him. Because at the Passover, at the communion, at the Last Supper, when Jesus is like, look, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. What would Peter say? No. There's no way. There's no way. I'm with you forever. I've got your back. Right? I've got your back. But what happened? Jesus is captured. Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus. Right? The, in, the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Peter kind of trails back. Um, I, I know it's a movie, but I love the passion of Christ and how they portray this part. Because right? he kind of gives you a visual. Peter kind of stayed back. He didn't necessarily want to be associated, but he wanted to see what happened. Right? That's part of his zeal. That's part of his passion. Right? He, wanted to, he wanted to see how this all played out. And then all of a sudden, people started recognizing him. People started recognizing him. He said, you're, you're the guy, you're, you're with him, you're with him. Three times Peter said, no, no, I don't know him. I don't know him, I want nothing to do with him. Now, now, before we give him a bad rap for this, like we give him a bad rap for the walking on water thing, right, that he took his eyes off of Jesus and, and began to sink and sink, and Peter and Jesus looked at him and said, why'd you look at the waves and the storm distracted him and all that, which we could apply to our lives tonight and how many storms are distracting us from the things of God and making us sink and all those things, but that's not what this message is about. Before we give Peter a bad rap about that, I want you to place yourself in Peter's shoes. You're there. Jesus is captured. You have no idea what's coming, but Jesus has told you it doesn't look really good, right? And all these things are starting to click for you. And out of fear and weakness, Peter denies him three times. Out of fear and weakness, Peter denies him three times. But his life was on the line. Like what if, I mean, I mean Peter had to know in that moment that he said, yeah, I've followed the dude for the last three years. Back in Matthew 4, he, he told me to follow him. And he would make me a fisher miss. So I dropped my nets. I followed him. I was with him when he fed, when he fed the 5,000. I was with him when he healed the blind man. I was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave. I was with him when he did all these things. If Peter would have stood up and affirmed that he was with him, he'd have been right next to Jesus. More than likely. And the fear of the unknown was the reason for his wreck. The reality we've got to come to deal with when it comes to restora restoration is this. Each and every one of us has weakness. We, we all have weakness. In fact, Paul tells the church at Corinth that it's in our weakness that his powers made perfect. It's that in our weakness that we're strong. And, and, and many of us, we're trying, to, we're trying to check our weaknesses at the door. We're trying to leave them in the car. We're trying to leave them in the parking lot. Because we don't, we don't want the family, we don't want the family to know our weaknesses. It's exhausting. You're weak. 
I'm weak. And the family of God is to be a place where we can be vulnerable and honest about our weaknesses. And then it's fear. And the second reality we have to come to is like Peter, each and every one of us fears something. We all fear something. A relationship ending, death, things happening to our kids, job, security, spiders. We all fear something. And so before, before, we, before we kick Peter, like we'd kick each other in this situation, let's remember that each of us battle weakness. Each of us have to face fears. In the most intense moment in his life, his weakness and his human frailty took over. And he was grieved. And he was grieved. So we've seen the rise. Immediately he dropped his nets. We've seen the wreck. And now I want us to look back at the restoration. Three times. Three times he asks him, do you love me? Now, this is interesting. Because. Well, well for two reasons. Number one. The three is significant. Why? Because Peter denied him three times, right? And so in the same way that he is that he's that 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 he denied him three times, he's being restored. He's being asked three times, affirming his love for Christ. The second reason is is significant and it's impactful is the words that are used for love here. We have different words that are used in the New Testament for love. Agape and phileo are two of them. And the first two times that we see Jesus ask Peter if he loves him, he's using phileo love. Now, phileo is the most common kind of love, right? It's like the, it's, you know, it's, it's the most common, it, it, it's, it's most equated with kindness, right? Kindness, that you're cordial, that you're kind to folks, right? And then the third time, when he asks him the third time, do you love me? It's agape love, which is, a, which is a step deeper. It's a more intimate love. It's a brotherly love. It's, a, it's an affectionate love. And so, and so Jesus just doesn't ask him, do, do you phileo me? Do, are you kind t- towards me? Are you cordial to me? But, but he asks him, do you love me? Do you care for me? Do you have my back? Are you with me? And of course, it would have grieved Peter, the last time he heard this, and it it even says Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? But the reasons that Jesus did this are threefold. The first is this, to restore him. I mean, that's what we're talking about. But not just to not just to restore Peter to kind of put the pieces to Peter of Peter back together, but to restore him into fellowship. To restore him into fellowship. I love thinking about Luke 15, the prodigal son. Right? The prodigal son goes and asks for the inheritance, goes, ends up with the pigs, he blows all the money, right? And he comes back home. What does father do? Father's on the porch, right? Runs after his son. Not customary for this time for fathers and for for for, for men of this status to run to get off the porch and to go greet. And he did. And he put his he put his ring on him. He put his robe on him. He killed the fattened calf for him. That ring was the family ring. Right? And so what that father was doing was restoring this son back into the family. Doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you smell like, doesn't matter what you spent the money on. You're back. You're in. No explanation needed. You're home. And that's all that matters. And so he restored him back into the fellowship. What Jesus is doing here is he's saying, hey, look. You denied me three times. I told you were going to do it, right? Jesus had the perfect I told you so moment with Peter. But you're still in. You're still in. 
you're still part of the family. I'm restoring you back into the fellowship. Secondly, to release him. To release him. There's nothing when it comes to sin that we need to set, be set free of more than guilt and shame. Man, it eats us alive. Guilt and shame over things that happened years ago, decades ago. Oh, if I'd have done that conversation differently. Oh, if I would have made a different decision. Oh, oh if, if I wouldn't have gone here or there. And what Jesus is doing here by asking Peter three times, do you love me? Is he's releasing him of the guilt and shame. He's saying, look, don't carry that any longer. If you love me, feed my sheep. He's releasing it. And then lastly, to remind him. If you look at John 21, in the last verse there that we read, verse 19, the last two words, after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Now, those are two important words, because those are the words we see in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus called him, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What, what Jesus is doing here with Peter is he's saying, listen, I've got to restore you back into the fellowship because you're part of the family. You're part of this whole mission that I'm putting together, right? I've got to release you from the guilt and shame because you can't carry that because you're about to launch the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit ever, right? That's going to that's gonna be the church, right? That's going to be the gift to people for, for years and years to come, all the way to 2021, right? When the Summit Church is going gonna, is gonna to gather in a new facility, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to keep them together and hold them together until, until greater things are, are to come for the glory of the Father, right? And so, and so what Jesus is doing here is He's reminding Peter of the mission. Follow me. Follow me. Yeah, you fell flat on your face. You're going to do that again. Follow me. Follow me. He's reminding him of the call. He's reminding him of the call. He's reminding him of the call. I was thinking yesterday as I was driving, driving around and I was thinking back to April of 2010. And that's significant to me. The reason being, I was at a conference in Orlando. And I knew that God was calling me away from my current place of ministry. I knew that was true, but I didn't know where I was called to yet. Because see, if God ever calls you away, He calls you to. Come on now. Come on now. Too many people feel called away, but they're not called to anything. Ooh, that'll preach. But we got to stay focused, Kat. Okay. And so I felt called away, but I didn't feel called to anything. And I was down in Florida. I was working a merchandise table for an author trying to sell his resources and books that were way overpriced. And so I was telling pastors on the side, look, I can get this to you for free. Just give me your email address. <laughs> that felt good, too. I haven't confessed that in a long time. That felt really good to get off my chest. And, uh, and these two guys walked up to me and they said, um, hi, I'm Scott. And I'm a pastor in Maine. And uh, I'm looking at this. One of them was, uh, Maine's shortest pastor. His name's Scott Tobby. And the other one is a guy by the name of Scott Lynn Scott that was at the time um, a youth pastor at First Baptist Church in Portland who was a youth pastor when my, my, when my wife gave her life to Jesus at a summer camp, which is awesome to meet that guy, right? <laughs> like, dude, you're awesome. I'm married. Like, anyway. And, um, and, uh, and I met these guys, and after having about a 10-minute conversation with each of them, and both of them praying over me, I knew God had called me to Maine. And as I was reflecting on that yesterday, as I was driving around, right, 
after, after, I'll be honest with you, an exhausting week, I said, thank you, Jesus, for reminding me of when you called me here. Because sometimes, no matter, no matter where you're at, you're going to need to be reminded of the call to upfit a bus to be a bakery. No matter where you're at, you're going to need to be reminded of the call to summon, to merge, to whatever God's called you to. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the call. And part of Peter's restoration was God saying, listen, what are you doing going back to fishing for fish? I called you to be a fisher of men. Follow me. Follow me. Because that call is still there. So how do we experience the restoration work of Jesus in our own lives? I'm glad you asked. Number one, be honest about your situation. And if we're honest with ourselves, this is, this is, this is probably the hardest step. is to be honest about what needs the coat of paint. Because we like to be prideful of our stuff, Right? And we like to think, we like to think, no, you know what? This looks great as it is, right? This looks great as it is. Don't touch this. If you ever watch any of those hoarder shows on like DIY or, 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 or HGTV, right? right? It's, 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 there, there's affection to these things. There's affection to paint colors. There's affection to, to walls that, that, that are standing that need to be knocked down or, or this or that, right? There's affection to those things. And it's hard for us to be honest about the areas of our life that need to be restored. It's hard to be honest about that because what happens when we are honest about our situation in those areas of our life that need to be restored, those wounds open back up again. That's fun. <laughs> Said no one. Ever. Right? But Peter, Peter was out there. Peter knew. Going back to the Passion of the Christ, one of the most impactful moments for me in watching that is right after he denies Jesus for the third time, Jesus and Peter make eye contact. Oh, man. And you can see, and again, I know it's acting. I know it's a movie. I, we don't know if that happened for real, right? But you can just see, it gives you the picture of in, in your mind, the realization that Peter came to, and now he was out there. He knew the area of his life that needed to be restored, and Jesus did too. Right? He was put out there. And some of you are telling yourself and other people a lie that you don't need to be restored. That you're good. And you know it's a lie. And he knows it's a lie. And so the first thing we have to do to experience restoration is to be honest with ourselves and God about our situation. Secondly, bring your need to him. Bring your need to him. Bring your need to him. Well, he knows it anyway. I know. But bring it to him. Bring it to him. In your brokenness, say, God, I need you here. God, I need you here. God, this is still... 10 years later, 15 years later, 10 months later, 15 months later, this still doesn't make sense to me and I need you to give, to, to either change the situation or change my perspective about it because I need healing here. I need restoration here. There's a patch job that needs to be done right here as a result of this. Thirdly, if we're going to experience the restoration work of Jesus in our own life, we've got to break free from our past. We've got to break free from our past. Scripture says, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. Right? Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. See, see our past is important. It's part of our legacy. If you look at hometown, right, the, the, the story of that house is valuable, right? It gives, it gives you a deeper, a greater appreciation for where it came from, right? There's some things that I took out of the building last week that people kind of looked at me funny, like, why in the world do you want that? Because I got a story about it. It means something to me. 
I'm not trying to hold on to a building. I'm trying to hold on to the memory, that stone of remembrance or a piece of palette of remembrance because it means something to me. Right? But we've got to break free from the past of beating ourselves up that says we're worthless. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. And then lastly, boldly step into who you are in Jesus. Boldly step into who you are in Jesus. Follow me. You remember what Peter steps into? I mean, we just talked about it for 12 weeks. Where Peter goes from here, Acts 1, Jesus ascends into heaven, right? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Right? And then Peter in Acts 2 gives the first recorded sermon post resurrection, and the church breaks free. Revival happens, and Peter is really the main person until Acts 9 when Paul comes on the scene and on the on the on the on the Damascus road gives his life to Jesus and then they work simultaneously hand in hand right so so Peter boldly after this stepped right into what God had for him stepped right into who he was in Jesus he didn't let he didn't let this wreck he didn't let this fall, keep him down for very long. Once Jesus reminded him, once Jesus restored him, he stepped into what God had for him. So my question for you very simply is this. What renovation does God need to do in your life today? What renovation does God need to do in your life today? He specializes in transformation, he specializes in renovation and restoration. What area of your life does Jesus need to restore today? And look, a couple things here, and then we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, and the worship team will come up. Okay, a couple things here. Number one, I recognize, I recognize that opening this up, having this conversation, a guy came and visited our church this morning from Pennsylvania, and he said, look, man, I applaud you for going there because many pastors are scared to go where you're going with your preaching these days. Okay? And look, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. I'm saying that because I know what I'm saying is hard. Try preparing it for a week. Okay? I know what I'm saying is hard. First bathroom I ever renovated in our dream home in 2011 because the people before us how do I say this? We're older. And uh, they didn't want bathtubs in their house, so they only had showers. Well, we had two kids, three and under, um, and we needed a bathtub. And so, hey, I got this. I didn't know Aaron Gant at the time or Shannon Hewlett. That would have been a lot easier. Or a lot of you guys in this room. That would have been a lot easier. But I went to Home Depot. I bought us a bathtub. thought, this can't be hard. Rip this out. Do this. Glue this in. Boom, boom, boom. Done, right? Four weeks later, done. Because as I ripped the shower out, I noticed a mold issue. So then Serve Pro had to come in. Then we had to replace the toilet. My dad and I went and picked up a toilet. We put the new one in. Dad hit a speed bump, leaving Home Depot, shattered the toilet in the van. So then we had to go in and get a, third, a second toilet to take home. This was fun. This was so fun. Four weeks later, we had a full bathroom renovation. That's going to happen in some of your lives when you start to look at what needs to be restored. Because you're going to uncover one area of your life, and then there's going to be another. And then there's going to be another. And then there's going to be another. And then there's that pride issue. And then there's that thing that you never dealt with that happened years ago that you've never had the conversation you need to have because of fear and weakness. And then there's this. And then there's that. The second thing we've got to deal with is this. I recognize that most of the things that God needs to restore in our lives are because of the church. I don't know any other way to say it than that inhales sharply. That's the Webster definition for sucks. <laughs> but it's true.
If you look at my life right now, the areas of my life that need a coat of paint are because of wounds that have happened within the body of Christ. And I don't know any other way to say it. I can't fix it for you. I wish I could. Man, I wish I could. I don't know any other way to say it than to say it shouldn't be that way. But how is God using that situation for His glory and your good? So let Him paint it. Forgive them. Because you carrying that is going to be more of a burden for you than it is for them because chances are they've completely forgotten about it and moved on. I'm sorry to break that to you. But it's true. People I go to apologize to for things that happened before so that I can be set free, they look at me and they're like, you've been carrying that? Yeah. Well, that's dumb. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Love you too, man. I recognize that a lot of the wounds that need to be restored within the body of Christ happen because of the body of Christ. Think about Think about it. And are you willing to begin a restoration process for you? Where God restores you. Where He releases you. And He reminds you that He's got a call in your life to go and make disciples as you go of all nations. I love Jesus. Man, I'm passionate about Jesus. Because he redeems us. Man, like we talked about last week. Because he restores us. And for more reasons than that that we'll talk about next week. Would you be willing to allow God tonight to begin a restoration work in your life. Whether it's a kitchen gut or a coat of paint. Let me pray for you. God, I just realized that we didn't look at Colossians 1, but that's okay because I believe you took over the message and you said exactly what you wanted to say. And God, I just pray that we would respond. I pray against any pride that would creep in as we hear this tonight that would keep us from beginning a restoration work with you. I would pray against any whisper that would say, nah, you're good. You don't need that. That message wasn't for you. Because God, I believe the message that you spoke tonight was for each and every one of us. And so I pray that in humility we look inward. And God, whatever fear, whatever hurt, whatever confusion that we're carrying in this moment, God, that you would begin to restore. God, even if you've got to take it down to the studs to get it there. Even if you've got to sand it back to its original color and build us back up. Because we've gone down so many paths, we've chased so many fairy tales, we've gotten so bored, we've become such spectators, whatever the case may be, do whatever you have to do to accomplish the work that you want to accomplish in each and every one of us. And may each and every one of us be willing to say that prayer. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes, God. Do whatever it takes. In Jesus' name.